greetings from the city College of New York. Today, we're going to be covering the application of complex numbers and solving inhomogeneous differential equations. Today, lecture number four, homogeneous second order differential equations. So, up to this point, we've been doing first order differential equations of the form y prime plus p of x times y is equal to q of x. So we've been talking about the integration constant and all of that stuff. So now, this is just first order differential equations. But often in mathematics you, uh, and physics, you don't just care about the first derivative, but also about the second derivative. For example, gravity. Let's say you have two planets that are orbiting around each other the gravitational force that they exert on each other, and thus their acceleration, is dependent on their position. So that means that the double derivative of position is dependent on position itself. So these are the second order differential equations that we want to solve. Now the most simple form of the second order differential equations are linear homogeneous second order differential equations. Yeah, it's a mouthful, isn't it? So, these are equations of the form ay double prime plus by prime plus cy is equal to zero, where a, b, and c are just coefficients. So, for example, simplest case, y prime prime plus y is equal to zero. So, here's what we want to do. Essentially, for these ones, the only kind of solution that we can have is y equals e to the something, most often a constant, like r, times our variable, which I realize we're using x instead of p now. So y equals e to the rx, for example. And why is that? Well, it's because it's very convenient for us to use e to the power of something because y prime is just going to be equal to that constant times y, and y double prime is equal to that constant squared times y. So that polynomial expression is much easier. Suddenly, when you plug these in to our actual formula, it becomes very obvious suddenly why we use this. And now, all we have to do is just cancel out the y's, and somehow we're left with will look like a quadratic. Why? Because it is. All we have to do is solve for the possible values of r. So for example, when we have y double prime plus y here, what are we actually solving for? Well, for our characteristic polynomial, as some call it, is just 1r squared plus 0r plus 1 is equal to to zero. So in other words, r squared plus 1 is equal to 0. Actually, this is an imaginary case, and we're not going to get into that until the end of this lecture. So let's try something a little bit different. Let's switch it up a little bit. All right. So for example, let's try y prime prime minus 2y prime plus 3y is equal to 0. Then our characteristic polynomial is r squared minus 2r plus 3. So then, what happens when we actually solve it? Well, shouldn't be the hardest thing in the world to factor it. Um, sorry, I intended for this to be a negative sign. So once we actually solve this equation, we get r times r minus 3 plus 1 times r minus 3 or in other words, the possible values of r are minus 1 or 3. So that means that our possible solutions are e to the minus t or e to the 3t. So those are our two solutions. Or are they? Because we can actually make any combination of them and plug this in. How does that work? Well, remember that if we take a constant times our function, then the derivative of this 
is just going to be equal to the constant times that first derivative, and taking the derivative of it again is going to give the constant times the second derivative. How is this useful, you might ask? Is this just basic calculus? Well, of course it is, but this is extremely useful for figuring this fact out. Because now, let's say we have some combination, c1 times y1 plus c2 times y2 of our two solutions, y1 and y2. And note that this can occur when you have a combination of more than two solutions too. It's just that you can already chain them together just by using this fundamental principle. So, all we have to do now is plug this in and see if it works. A, Y. So given that A, Y, 1, double prime, plus B, Y, 1, single prime, plus C, Y, 1, equals 0, and given the same thing for a different solution, Y, 2, now, plugging in, we get A times C1, Y1, double prime, plus C2, Y2, double prime, plus B times C1, Y1, single prime, plus C2, Y2, single prime, plus C times C1, Y1, plus C2, Y2. You will recognize that if we factor out C1, we actually get A, Y1, prime, prime, plus B, Y1, prime, plus CY1, which goes to zero. And then if we factor out C2, we have the same exact thing, but for Y2. And that also goes to zero. So we can be ensured that the general solution, Y is equal to C1 e to the minus T, plus C2 e to the three T, will actually satisfy this equation. You can go check for yourself, for example, that e to the minus t plus 4 e to the 3t will work. So now, let's get into some more complicated things. So, for example, remember this from earlier, r squared plus 1 equals 0? Nightmare for you, right? Why? Well, because you might notice that the solutions to this are actually imaginary. And that's where imaginary and complex numbers come in. So, let's say we have an imaginary polynomial, like y equals x squared plus 2x plus 3. So how would you solve for its root? The same way you solve for any normal quadratic polynomial too. Now, you don't do the old factoring trick on this one. You just put down the quadratic formula, so 2 minus 4ac over 2a. And now I'm realizing this is actually not the nicest, but we'll still go with it anyway. So we get i rad 10 over 2 equals minus 1 plus i times rad 10 over 2. So now, what the heck do we do with this? Well, here's the kicker. We can actually use Euler formula. And if you want to understand where this comes from, all you need to know is Taylor series of the specific function. So e to the x is Taylor series, cosine x is Taylor series, and sine x is Taylor series. So now, how does this, how do this and this work together to give us a solution? So for example, this is a characteristic polynomial of the function that is described by y double prime plus 2y single prime plus 3y is equal to 0. So that's the differential equation of which this is a characteristic polynomial. So now, how does this formula come into play? Well, from earlier, remember the two solutions that we had. Minus 1 plus i root 10 over 2, and minus 1 minus i root 10 over 2. So, here now, you have that the solutions are going to be to the, minus, uh, to, to the i root 10 over 2 x. And same thing, but negative over here. So then, all we have to do is spread it out in its proper form. So we get that this is just going to be equal to e to the minus x times cosine root 10 over 2x plus sine. I sine root 10 over 2x. But, uh, but then you might start asking, 
Well, Suborno, what was the point of doing this if we end up with an I right over here anyway? I thought our goal was to eliminate the imaginary part. And yes, that's correct. But this actually makes it much easier for us to remove the imaginary part. Because now, all we have to do is, we know that foiling this with this is going to create something imaginary. So we cross this off. So then, our solution is e to the minus x cosine root 10 over 2x. Doesn't even depend on the plus or minus sign because cosine is an even function. So this is our only solution to that uh, differential equation. So yeah, that's linear, homogeneous, second-order differential equations for you, and see you in the next one.